What you're about to see might be shocking to you, but really that's not the purpose of this program. The purpose is to uplift the lovely Jesus and his truth, the one who died on the cross of Calvary and shed his precious blood for you and for me. Yes, to uplift him, his truth, in such a way that God's SDA people will be encouraged and comforted and strengthened to meet the Catholic charismatic attack on God's SDA church. If you don't believe there is one, just read Revelation 12:17 and Revelation 19:10. We're going to go now on an awesome journey together and learn things that might make you tremble. But keep in mind that God is in control. The lovely Jesus is walking among the candlesticks. And that gives me a lot of comfort. Now, I have no apologies to give to the devil for what you're going to learn, because you're going to learn things that the devil does not want God's Seventh-day Adventist people to know. As an ordained Seventh-day Adventist minister, I stand in loyal defense of God's Seventh-day Adventist church against this attack. I'm going to give you, in a nutshell, uh, a view of some of the things that we're going to be learning here. So watch very closely now as you see some of the things we're going to see in this program. Uh, many of these militants organizations, uh, I train and prepare how they can become Baptists, how they can become Adventists, how they can become uh, 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 Methodists, how they can become Presbyterian, how they can become Pentecostal, and all these areas where they most infiltrate any area. Of a master hypnotist teaching pastors neuro-linguistic programming, to help them get more converts and help their members to be in happy subjection. He teaches master level his hypnosis, mm -hmm. um, and he what he incorporates into these calling and caring church ministry is neuro linguistics programming, which is called NLP. Mm -hmm. um, it's based on Ericksonian hypnosis, mm -hmm. and I found all that out because I called the psychologist in Boone. I called my mother, and she's a hip she's a hypnotist. Your mother? My mother is a hypnotherapist. Yeah. She has an MA and she has a certification in hypnosis. So I wrote down every person I called. I took notes on everything they said. Excitement and healing of the Catholic charismatic movement, which is attacking God's church. People, church is fun. Yeah. You ought to have more fun in church than you have any place else. on the importance of keeping Sunday as the Sabbath. In Revelation 12, 17, it says, quote, The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now here is the description of the battle. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 2 tells us that the dragon is the devil. He makes war against the only church in the world 
which keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus. And as you know, as a Seventh-day Adventist, the uh, testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you this. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy. And you can see why the devil hates it and is trying to attack it. Now, here's a question. What is the right arm of the devil's strength uh, that he will use to help attack God's uh, remnant church and to try to hinder it from getting God's three angels' messages out to the world? Well, in Testimonies to Ministers, which I'm picking up right now, Testimonies to Ministers, page 473, it tells us that it's quoting, actually, God's prophet is quoting the devil. And uh, the devil here is talking to his angels. And he says, quote, We led the Romish church to inflict imprisonment, torture, and death upon those who refused to yield to her decrees. Now that we are bringing the Protestant churches and the world into harmony with this right arm of our strength, we will finally have a law to exterminate all who will not submit to our authority. Testimonies to Ministers, page 473, tells us that the right arm of the devil's strength is the Romish church. Well, here it is in the Bible, uh, Revelation uh, 17, verse 3 to 6. I'm going to pick up the Bible here, and I'm going to quote it for you. Starting with verse 3. It says, And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, in looking at this tremendous attack against God's remnant church, we're going to start right with the mother of harlots, and begin with an interview with an ex-Jesuit priest. So listen very closely now to this interview. I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government. Uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, uh, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. Just before I made this program, I contacted a friend of mine and told him that with the information that God has given me came the conviction that I must share it with God's dear Seventh-day Adventist people. I told him that I needed him to help me because what he has been doing and the research that he has done has um, brought to view a lot in this area. He wrote me and encouraged me to go ahead and make this unusual program for the good of God's people. He said that he'd like to help make it with me, but he had a certain project on the Sabbath 
that he was doing at the time, but he wanted to help me. Well, I received his letter just a few days before his death. He's resting in Jesus today, and I believe with all my heart that you and I are going to see him again in that wonderful land where Jesus is. His name is Jim Arabito. In his letter, he told me to use any of his material to help make this program that you're looking at right now. And, you know, his death has inspired me, and I believe inspired many, many people to take up the torch where he left it and to go forward with the power and love of Christ to reach the dear people to help them to wake up and to be prepared for what is coming upon this earth and the coming of the lovely Jesus and to give God's warning against the Catholic charismatic attack on God's SDA church I'm going to show you an excerpt of a videotape with Brother Jim showing more of what this ex-Jesuit priest reveals and also showing experiences of a retired Seventh-day Adventist minister and other Seventh-day Adventist members who have experiences that shed light on this subject and will help you a little better understand a background of this tremendous attack that God's people are facing. What you're about to see now, you no doubt have never seen or heard in your life. But what Brother Jim and others reveal to us, I believe will help strengthen you and all of God's SDA people. For it says, the dragon was wroth with the woman. I'm encouraging you to share this program that you're watching now with every faithful, humble, Seventh-day Adventists that you can find to help them know what we're facing. God loves us, friend. Friend, He loves you. The lovely Jesus died on the cross for you. And if you'll only make that total surrender to Him, you can lay your head down on your pillow knowing that everything's all right between you and God. Make your calling and election sure because soon we are going to see his face. Oh, yes. Now, we know that uh, the Bible tells us, and I'm telling you, please, do not become an accuser of the brethren. Uh, we must be the kindest, sweetest, humble people in all the world so that people will get a glimpse of what Jesus is like, you see. God will use his people to vindicate his character before the universe. We must not be fault finders or false accusers or lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. But God wants us to love people, people, as he loved them. To love them enough to tell them what God says. The Bible brings to view this attack of infiltration. Look now at what it says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, verse 9, and Revelation 3, 9. I'm reading. It says, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. Oh, yes. Now, verse 9. It brings to view, it says, I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. This is under the church of Smyrna. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. In other words, they say they're God's people. They say, today they would say they were Seventh-day Adventists, but are of the synagogue of Satan, it says. Then, in chapter 3, it says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Watch how God's prophet Ellen White places Revelation 3.9 in the future. 
here in Early Writings, page 15. She says, The 144,000 were all sealed and perfectly united. On their foreheads was written, God, New Jerusalem, and a glorious star containing Jesus' new name. At our happy, holy state, the wicked were enraged and would rush violently up to lay hands on us to thrust us into prison when we would stretch forth the hand in the name of the Lord and they would fall helpless to the ground. Then it was that the synagogue of Satan knew that God had loved us who could wash one another's feet and salute the brethren with a holy kiss and they worshipped at our feet. Praise God. Oh, yes, friend, this is coming. It's in the future. The synagogue of Satan is going to fall at the feet of God's people, even though it's described under the Church of Philadelphia in Revelation 3. So don't worry now. You see, now we must treat infiltrators like the lovely Jesus treated the infiltrator in his church, Judas. Read about it in the chapter in Desire of Ages called... He ordained twelve. And read about it in the chapter, same book, called Judas. Listen closely now to the words of Jim before his death and to the others that I've mentioned as they are interviewed. As a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm very, very interested in the fulfillment of prophecies in these last days. Especially am I aware of the place of Roman Catholicism in closing events. Well, I was on a street ministry in Berkeley about ten years ago. I became acquainted with a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest from the University of San Francisco. In fact, he told me that the Roman Catholic Church will rule the world again. For a while, I was in a state of shock. You know, it just happens to be that although we're Seventh-day Adventists, many times we don't see in reality the very things that we supposedly believe. It hit me very hard. and I, be You know, we as Adventists expect somehow to see all these events take place out in the open. But you know, I found that that is not what Revelation 17 tells us. Revelation 17, verse 3 says this, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. Well, a scarlet colored beast is all the political powers that are going to pull together to destroy the commandments of God. The woman riding on that beast is Roman Catholicism and fundamental Christianity. John describes these things as taking place in the wilderness. Now, in reading Revelation chapter 12, we know that when the primitive church fled persecution, she went into the wilderness. And in Great Controversy, page 55, Ellen White tells us that the wilderness is a symbol that represents obscurity and seclusion. This means that at the end of time, Roman Catholicism is working in secret with the rulers of this world in an effort to control the world, to take it over. And I believe that time is right upon us. You know, I plan to put together a documentary film called The Missing Dimensions in World Affairs. And for that film, I had gathered together interviews with people who had had either personal experiences with infiltration of Jesuits or Catholic priests, or... In one instance, an interview with an ex-Jesuit priest by the name of Alberto Rivera. and another, a secret agent uh, for the federal government working for the Pentagon during the Second World War, and his wife was the chief stenographer of the Pentagon. All the funds that went over to Europe for the troops passed first through the Vatican. This man had had personal um, working relationships with Roman Catholic priests and listen to him he knows what he's talking about I was in Chicago years ago and I was canvassing as a car porter selling Bible reading film circle and we come to one great big mansion where uh, the folks were rich in that area 
and cars all around it and so forth. But I went up the door, and I was pretty sure this fellow was Catholic, so I gave him the Catholic canvas. And he invited me in, and then as soon as he got in, he turned the key and, and the door, and I said, wait a minute, what am I getting into? He opened another door into a great big mammoth, parlor and a great big mammoth dining room with double doors in between and all seated around the whole business was uh, uh, prelates from some from Europe and all the big ones from America they were planning the Eucharistic Congress in Chicago that was way back in the 1920s and uh, when uh, they started talking to me they tried to get me to be one of them and offered me every kind of a conceivable opportunity that you could think of they offered me everything money, scholarship and the whole works and told me the advantage of being Catholic and what they were planning on doing in America and with America they said we're going to take over America and they, and we've already got it fixed so know how in the world can they escape becoming under our authority and where well, we'll be in the jurisdiction and take over. I said, well, how are you going to take over the South? It's it's uh, predominantly Protestant. I said, we're going to seed the South with Catholic families. And then when they marry into the Protestants, their children will be raised Catholic, and before long we'll have uh, a quarter, and then we'll have a third, then we'll have over half, and when we get over half, we, we've got America. That's one way of doing it. But says that we've got other ways, too. Well, I says, supposing all this was known, and the people, the Protestants knew this, uh, he said, if they knew what we were planning on doing, there'd be bloodshed in 24 hours and lots of it in 48. I says, are you prepared to take over in case that that happens? He said, yes, we have our standing armies. We have everything all prepared with guns, ammunition, and the whole works. And... Uh, said, uh, we can take over, and you might as well join us and be in the, with us and, and get in on the, the right side of the fence. I said to him, I said, listen, there is nothing you can do to invigor me to become a Catholic. I mean nothing. I said, I know my horse is going through to eternity, and I'm riding on it. I know your horses aren't, and I know that you'll be non-plus entities when I'll be enjoying eternity and having a good time forever. And I'm going to see to it that I'm on the right side of the fence. And I know which side I'm on now. And uh, I said, you might as well open the door and let me out because I know that other people know that I'm in here and there'll be an investigation made if, if you don't let me out. One of the big fellows with a red... Cardinal Hat got up and said, Sir, he says, we're going to let you out. But we want you to know one thing, that everybody that's born in the United States that's not born a Catholic is on a card. You're put on a white card to begin with and kept on a white card until we feel like that we need to watch you. After that, we put you on a blue card and said after you're on a blue card for a while if we feel like it, we just assume you wasn't existing you're on a red card so from now on you'll be on the red card as long as you live and I know they know me where I'm living and have followed me all around throughout life they're still doing it and uh, well I could tell you a lot of stories but that's just one while knocking uh, on different doors to gain entrance, he was invited into a home very quickly, and he wondered how come he didn't have to use his door openers. When he went in, the fellow who uh, had invited him into his home said, I know who you people are. And he said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, let me show you something here. And he moved a, aside a rug from uh, his flooring there, and under that rug was a door. He lifted up the door, and here were stairs that went down into a basement. And he said, I would like to show you something. So they went down into the basement, and this individual whose home he was in uh, showed him just many files. And as he was looking at these files, he wondered what it meant. He says, well, he says, we know who you are, 
And I would like to ask you a question. Name me a name of somebody who belongs to your church. And so he said, okay. He named him a name, one of his uh, girlfriends. And he, this man went to a file, picked out that name, and said, this person was baptized on such and such a date, a member of such and such a church, etc. And my friends said his eyes got very large, and he says, well, what does this mean? How come you have this information here? And this fellow said, well, I belong to the Catholic Church. I belong to a special order. And we have all of you on files in different parts of the country. This is the file that we have on your members of your church here. We know who you are, and we have more complete records on you than I believe you people have for yourself. He said, I just wanted you to see that so you would know that we know who you are. Well, my friend left that home. He didn't sell any books, but I think he became a, a more serious uh, thinking individual after that. Because I was always able to open up to anybody that I cared anything about, even a friend, much less your husband. And he was this way all the time I was married to him. Very evasive. Was he? And he would act so bitter when he left. He'd get me all upset to where I'd tell him, why, why don't you leave, Joe? And so he'd act so sad, but he'd leave. And I saw later that he really intended it to be this way. Very dear neighbors that lived across the street from me. And they knew my husband and they had known us for years. And so when Joe and I were married and he would try to communicate with them, but I don't know if he was revealing anything to them that he wasn't saying to me. But these folks told me, they were first to tell me that Joe, in fact, was a priest. He said, Hitler was one of our very good people. Hitler and Mussolini, he said, you know, were good Catholics. And he said, also the mafia. He said, we have, we have some good people in our church. When I showed him the book that I had gotten, written by Samuel Bacchiocchi, he said, that's one of our men. And uh, so he said, notice where it was published. And he turned right away to to the area in the front of the book where it tells you published in Rome. And he pointed that out very carefully to me. We had to go over to another office, another group of offices, and see a cardinal. And so we, when we went to discuss our marriage with the cardinal, Joe was rather talking down to the cardinal. And I felt this was sort of unusual because realizing just common knowledge that that people didn't talk down to a cardinal if they were Catholics. And I thought that to be a bit strange. And the cardinal took Joe. Uh, the two of them walked away, supposedly out of range of my hearing. And that's when I realized that he, in fact, was a Catholic priest. And then when I heard the discussion about the priesthood, I threw up the papers and I said, I've had it. I'm going to quit. This is it. I'm not going to be married. I could hear little bits about uh, your position and this position and that position. He had a serious mission within him that he carried out. What organizations have now been taken over by the Jesuit order and other institutes of Catholicism? What world powers are in her hands to be used in this final chess game for the takeover of the world? We can get some idea when we look back to the Council of Trent in the 1540s through the 1560s. At that time, and during those years, we find vows that were taken by these secret orders to take over the education of the Protestants, take over their schools, take over their churches, especially to destroy the Protestant Bible by creating many translations, destroy the monarchies of Europe, destroy nationalism, to use astronomy and astrology to create new calendars that would eventually transfer the sanctity from Sabbath or Saturday to Sunday. Their goal was to take over the business world, internationalism. They were to take over banking, to take over Judaism and the movement of Zionism. 
to create political strife and chaos and all of these things for one end, that Catholicism should rule. The intention behind the Council of Trent was the Counter-Reformation. What was the intent of the Vatican Council II? Another Counter-Reformation, but called today, how you call it? Renewal. You see the point? Now, the change was not name, but the intentions were the same. Yes. See, more sophisticated today. Yes. You see, the Counter-Reformation was taken through the, uh, through the Council of Trent. That was the entire Counter-Reformation was uh, performed by the Council of Trent, decrees. Then through that time, until today, Vatican Council II came about with the idea of renewal. That means another a step forward in the final. I will say this is the final stage of a Counter-Reformation. Now, how about the Charismatic Movement? What's, what's the connection with that? The Charismatic Movement is serving the purpose uh, as we said, of a, a, one of the many issues, uh, as we said about Saturdays and Sunday, uh, they'll pick it up every issue with different denominations. And in the case of the charismatic movement, they pick up the, the charismatic movement because one factor, they could not bring under subjection the Pentecostal denominations. They couldn't. They could not. Even when they went to the ecumenical movement before, from 1945 down to our day, since at this uh, already starts, as a matter of fact, if you want to know, the World Council of Churches started by financed by the Jesuits in Europe in 1945 after the end of the Second World War already, or by the time that the World War was uh, to end, already the Jesuits were at work trying to unite all the Protestants in Europe. Uh, and that was the origin of the World Council of Churches and the Ecumenical Movement. Today the Charismatic Movement is serving that purpose. Where the Pentecostal could not be bring into the Ecumenical Forum, they brought it through the exercise a Charismatic Gift. Spiritualism and the Papacy is as close as two fingers are on your hand. The uh, Catholic Church is his one biggest most extensive organization that there is in the world. Yeah, right. uh, communism was really started by the Catholic Church, and the Pope himself is allied with them and a communist himself. They sent some Jesuits into a little town where they wanted to start Catholicism. Now this I learned from E.T. Babienko that worked with me <coughs> on a lot of uh, uh, detective work that I did and E.T. Bobby Enko told me that after they had no success for a, a short while they substituted the place with uh, twice as many Jesuits as they had in the beginning and after years they get, got nowhere so they said the only way in the big uh, meetings in uh, the Vatican where the headmen all meet, they said the only way we'll ever get anywhere in putting Catholicism in Russia is to take away the children from the parents and do away with the Greek Orthodox Church by training the children otherwise. And in their brains, this was all formulated, and they decided to put communism into Russia and to put hard boiled communism, which is Bolshevism, and later bring it on to a de-Christianized Christian Bolshevism. They utilize anything and everybody to bring their uh, means to an end. His people run our church. He said. Who were his people? The Catholic Church. The Catholic Church run the, all churches. He said that to you? Yes, yes. We get a sense of the tremendous confidence that the Roman Catholic Church has now in her position of dominating the nations and its institutions. Very soon we're going to be locked into a period of terrible persecution and there'll be many martyrs among the faithful Christians. Listen to the words of Revelation 17 verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. She is uniting with the rulers of the world. Listen, 
in verse 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Rulers in this world will give their political power to a system, a political system that will be dominated by the papacy. And that system is going to make war upon God uh, and his followers. In Revelation 18, part of our last message to the world is to tell the world, all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornications, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, that the governments of the world are in an unholy alliance with the Roman papacy and God is going to judge them. We find in the history of the Wallensees by Wiley and the Wallensees by Claudiana, a book written in Rome, that the early Christians who wanted to stay pure and stay faithful to the apostolic faith removed themselves into the mountains and the remote areas of Europe and there they raised their families. But even there the armies of Rome found them. The church was now the destroyer and some of the most horrible scenes in the history of the world took place at that time. But when they heard of the great reformation that was taking place in Germany and in Switzerland, they sent representatives and they joined the reformation and a tremendous movement took place against the power of Rome. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created, the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery, cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscience wholly silenced. They knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power, to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the reestablishment of the papal supremacy. When appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prisons and hospitals, ministering to the sick and the poor, professing to have renounced the world, and bearing the sacred name of Jesus, who went about doing good. But under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable but commendable when they served the interests of the church. They told me that they were going to cede the South. And with what they told me then, I knew they were planning World War II. My wife was the head stenographer in the Vatican, I mean in the Pentagon at that time. Mm -hmm. And she gave all the orders and sent out all the orders to the big men. And she had orders to see that there was no Protestant flew over the Vatican and over Rome because they were afraid that they might, through uh, their own ingenuity, want to drop a bomb there. We got in places where we wanted to know things. And we put on uh, priest garbs, dressed up like a priest, and he put on even garbs on beyond the priesthood. Well, because he spoke in 44 languages more fluent than I do in English, and his wife speaks 33 languages fluent, why, well, and he understands enough in other languages right away quick, and he picks them up like magic. The, Lord, the General Conference used him for interpreter to go between a lot of these places wherever they needed him. And he went to Europe and went to Asia and a lot of these different things. And when he went to, to uh, Asia, uh, he was over in the Himalaya Mountains uh, where it's so difficult to learn the language. Uh, he learned some things was going on in Europe and he wanted to go over and find it out. So he took an airplane and he flew over there and he dressed up like a big head man in the Catholic Church and he went in with among these other men and he purported that he couldn't understand their language they had to get him an interpreter so they got him an interpreter and he understood their language better than they did and he understood everything they were saying and everything they were saying about him and uh, that way why he, he fooled them to where they thought he was a high dignitary and he went in and found out things that he wouldn't otherwise. If they took the children away from the parents that they could uh, 
control and get Catholicism in the lady later. So they put in hard shelled Bolshevik communism, and uh, they said, "Well, we will uh, know that and uh, get a choice in that way later on, and put in a de-Christianized Christian communism." And they planned all this ahead. And he he learned this. And they had Hitler picked, and his face altered to do the job. They sent what money. What do you mean by his face altered? Well, they altered his nose and different things. Now we have a breakdown in the communism. It isn't the old Bolshevik cosm communism, and Catholicism is being put in Russia, and our work is going forward because. They couldn't let Catholicism in without letting us in. And keep in mind, friend, that God is all-powerful. God is love, and God is in control. The lovely Jesus is the head of his church, and we have nothing to fear, nothing, except as we forget him and the way he's led us in our past history. Oh, yes, Jesus is walking among the candlesticks. It gives us a lot of comfort. Friend, he died for you. If you'll only make that total surrender to him and trust him as a little child, you can have that perfect peace. Now, we're going to go quickly now. God wants you to be prepared, to be strengthened, to not be a weak-kneed coward, to not cave in when these things happen that God's prophet says is coming upon the earth that's right ahead of us now. He wants us to be men and women of love, men and women of courage and strength, good soldiers of the cross. And he wants you to be prepared for these things that are just ahead of us. And he wants to use you to get God's three angels' messages out to the people of this world before they're dead. Here's the black pope in front of St. Peter's Basilica, Taken from the Catholic Journal 30 Days, February 1989. The article tells that the Pope can count on them. The black Pope is, of course, the Supreme Jesuit General, head of all the Jesuits around the world. And um, here is the sign of the sun, which is the sign of the Jesuits. In this article, it talks of a new vigor in the work of evangelization. Well, what kind of evangelism would the Jesuits do? In the Power of the Jesuits by Fulop Miller and this book, The Jesuit, their spiritual doctrine and practice, we get a, a, uh, a history of the Jesuit order. We find that Inigo, the father of the order, was born in the Valley of Loyola, Loyola in northern Spain. Here he was born to a wealthy family. Ignatius, as a young man, was a violent, brutish sort. The police records of the day said violent, vindictive, and dangerous. He was a proud young man and involved himself in many of the sins and evils of the day. But unfortunately, in a, a battle with the French in Pamplona, he shattered his leg. And now his plans for the future as a great warrior were ended. There, while he was recuperating, he read books about the saints and about Jesus. These were fanciful bo books about the saints, about the miracles and the things they could do. He envisioned Christ as a great commander. And now he, as a saint, would capture the world for Jesus Christ. He had had a nervous breakdown, and this concept illustrated the condition that his mind was in. We had to stay in this little town called Monresa for ten months. There in that town, as we arrived there, we found a monstrous institution of the Jesuits built over the place where Ignatius stayed there. It was a cave. Ten months in the cave, he tortured his body and his mind until, in exhaustion, he began to have dreams and visions. He claimed that the secret doctrine of the Catholic Church was taught to him in this place. In his eye, he saw lights flashing. And he believed that Mary came in the form of a light in Jesus. And he believed that he saw Satan in a spiral of light eyes before him. He believed that he had chased Satan around like a dog with a stick and many other fanciful concepts, but he claimed that these teachings he received there were the foundation of his entire movement. And it's here he began the spiritual exercises of Ignatius. These were uh, experiences that a master Jesuit would bring novices through, would bring other people through to give them the same kind of mind that, that Ignatius developed through his experience. 
They were brought uh, through these experiences just like music on a sheet. For 30 days, they were told what to think, how to feel, when to groan, and when to sigh, what to imagine, and they were to cut off all normal human emotion throughout those experiences. Ignatius finally made his way to Jerusalem, but there the Franciscan monks told him to, monks told him to go home. We don't want any political trouble here in the Muslim Empire. We've had enough of that. So making his way back to the port of Barcelona, Ignatius sat with little children learning the rudiments of Latin in order to study. From there he made his way to the little college in the town of Alcala, north of Madrid. Here at the Colegio Mayor he began his studies in theology. While he was there he gathered a little group of, of men and women around him and began to bring them through his mental exercises. They would faint and fall aside. They would scream and pass out. Friends, this is demonic activity that this man was involved in, even in his early history. And in time, he was accepted by the Pope. From that time, Rome was the center of this new satanic system, the Jesuit order. This is the Chiesa del Gesù in Rome. And entering into it, we get some idea of the wealth and the power of the Society of Jesus. Their death mask of Loyola was made into a picture. We get a view of what he looked like. But the altars and the artwork are the ancient Baroque style, and it's a magnificent structure showing that the wealth of the nations at one time flowed into this order. It was at the hands of the Jesuits that millions of people suffered the most horrible deaths, terrible suffering that goes beyond our imagination today. These people did not realize that as they were persecuting these people, as they were torturing their flesh and causing every nerve in the body to scream in pain, they were causing the sufferings of Jesus Christ himself in his people. In Fox's Book of Martyrs and other books, it tells about the tremendous campaigns that raged against those who had fled into the mountains to have religious freedom. The record of history has been rewritten, folks, by the Roman Catholic religion. The Jesuits became the controllers of history. And thus, the record of millions of faithful souls is not available to us. The Spirit of Prophecy tells us that that record is written in heaven. The church, every time she wanted to evangelize or infiltrate another area of the world, set up schools or colleges there in Rome. This became the origin of the Pontifical Gregorian University. Its purpose is for, for the subversion of the world. In Guri's Doctrine of the Jesuits, this also is available in the library here at PUC, we learn the secret of how the Jesuits became the masters of the confessional. They could excuse sin by subtle evasion. And because of it, the wealthy powers of the earth beat a path to the Jesuit confessional. They learned the secrets of state. They sent this to the head of their order. And through it, they were able to manipulate the emperors and the rulers of the world. The Ceremony of Induction and Extreme Oath of the Jesuits. Library of Congress, Catalog Card, number 6643354. Listen closely now, friends, because these people are not joking. I promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women, and crush their infants' heads against the walls, in order to annihilate forever their execrable race." that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the pinyard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith, the Society of Jesus." Uh, it's necessary that you get a glimpse of this vast system of Babylon, even uh, starting right back in ancient Babylon, coming right down through time.
Protestants have tampered with and patronized popery. They have made compromises and concessions which papists themselves are surprised to see and fail to understand. Men are closing their eyes to the real character of Romanism and the dangers to be apprehended from her supremacy. The people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. This is Great Controversy 566. Now notice this last sentence. The people need to be aroused to resist. You see, the word resist means to do something and not nothing. The advances, that means it's moving, of this most, notice the word most dangerous, foe to civil and religious liberty. Now, who said this, friend? Was it a madman? No, it was the loving and kind prophet of God. Uh, persecutions of the past will be repeated when the threefold union unites for the exaltation of Sunday. You see, friend, we're no in, we're not in any uh, Disneyland here. We're in a battle, friend. And I believe that God's Seventh Adventist people need to comprehend what's happening, what's going on, so that we won't just drift along until the devil can spring his trap. This is why, of course, the book National Sunday Law was written, so that as time even now is running out for this world and as this Sunday law which the devil has been planning for a long time and originated with the mother of harlots is getting closer and closer. God's people will have a tool that they can use to put on doorsteps, phone booths, benches, give to people, bulk mail to thousands of preachers and rural routes which church, Advent churches have already been doing all over this country to help people avoid the mark of the beast that will, of course, plunge millions into the lake of fire of hell. Oh, friend, we need to get God's three angels' messages out. We don't understand how much we need to do it. The Great Controversy, page 570. If we desire to understand the determined cruelty of Satan, manifested for hundreds of years, not among those who never heard of God, but in the very heart and throughout the extent of Christendom, we have only to look at the history of Romanism. Through this mammoth system of deception, the Prince of Evil achieves his purpose of bringing dishonor to God and wretchedness to man. And as we see how he succeeds in disguising himself and accomplishing his work through the leaders of the church, we may better understand why he has so great antipathy to the Bible. All that he asks is a broken and contrite heart, a humble, obedient spirit. Now, watch closely as I show you documentation of how the papacy is uniting with every conceivable organization, including uh, the charismatic movement, and then you're going to see the Catholic charismatic attack on God's SDA church. Here's a letter to me from a lady over 90 years old from Maine. We thank you for your nice letter and the reports you've given us. We heard a couple of years ago about the Jesuits and the Black Pope. My husband and I came from Germany in 1933. I came out of school and remember when Hitler came and took over. He was Catholic and the Gestapo was Jesuit. Germany, the U.S., is in a situation like Germany was back before Hitler took over. The Baptists in Germany helped Hitler get in. Hitler cleaned Germany up from filth and homosexuality. Today, it reminds me of Germany. And I am not surprised that the Jesuits have infiltrated all other organizations. This was told to me by Dr. B.G. Wilkinson, who was president of the college. There had been a new Bible instructor hired by the board. And this man had been teaching Bible to the undergraduate theological majors for about five months. Now, Dr. Wilkinson had always encouraged an open-door policy, and he encouraged the confidences of his students, especially his theological students. Now, some of these young men came to him after a period of about four or five months, and they said, Dr. Wilkinson, there's, you know, you, you teach Bible differently than this new Bible instructor does. There's some things about him that we don't understand. He brings up doubts in the classroom. Doubts about our theological position, about our doctrines. These doubts are then not resolved. They're left 
sort of hanging in the air. And they had other questions, which Dr. Wilkinson couldn't, couldn't answer. It aroused Dr. Wilkinson's suspicions about this man. Now, the teachers had in, in uh, old Columbia Hall uh, little pigeonholes, boxes where their mail uh, slots, you know, they used to uh, put their uh, mail in these little pigeonholes and the faculty would come and pick up their, their letters. Uh, this one day, uh, Wilkinson saw an envelope being placed by the mailman in the mail slot for this uh, Bible teacher. And the letter was a rather long, rectangular, official-looking letter. And after the mailman left, Dr. Wilkinson stepped over to the box and he drew the letter out. And he looked at it, and the return address was a Hereford Road address. Now, Wilkinson knew that that was a Jesuit college. It wasn't located too far from Washington Missionary College. He took the letter, and he steamed it open. Wilkinson thought, I'm going to steam this letter open. And if, if it's an innocent thing, I'll just close it up again and say nothing. He steamed it open, and inside he found orders from this young man's superior, telling the young man, outlining to him, what he was to preach or, or teach uh, in his Bible class for the next several months. Dr. Wilkinson reinserted the letter, gummed the flap back on. He called the young teacher in. He said to this young man, he had the letter on his desk, you know, and he said to this young man, I have a piece of mail for you. And he handed it to him. And he said, he says, we know who you are, and we know why you are here. You are a Jesuit. Are you not? The young man looked across the desk at Dr. Wilkinson. He picked up his mail, turned on his heel, and walked out. And that was the last they ever saw of this man. He never even stopped to pick up his pay. But he cleared off of that campus the very same hour. When I was in detective work in Washington, D.C. during World War II, I was going home to Alexandria, Virginia from Washington, D.C., and when I got to the mall, there was two scholars, and they were sticking up their fingers for a ride. I says, I'll just pick them up and put them in the back seat and see what I can find out from them. And so when they got in the back seat and was seated, I asked them, I said, you boys are from Georgetown University taking the priesthood, aren't you? They said, well, we're taking uh, studies to uh, work with the Protestant churches and get them to come in to the, do what the church wants them to do and to work with them and work with us. And uh, I said, well, how many of you folks are taking the course. We said well, about 780. I said, uh, now, uh, uh, how many graduated last year? And they told me. And then I said, the year before that. And they told me. And I went back to them. We had about 3,800 people graduated out in the field. And I said, well, what do you boys do when you go out in the field? Now I said, at first I want to know... Uh, uh, how, how many graduate next year? Well, it says it'll be somewhere under 900 anyway. And I said, how how about, uh, what do you do when you uh, graduate? He said, well, the first thing, we change our names. And when we change our names, then we're allocated so many to this church, so many to that church, and to another church. And I said, when you go out to the churches, then what do you do? He said, well, the first thing we do is look around for some nice young lady that we'd like to make an a associate member uh, with, and then uh, we marry them. And after we're married, we go off to a, a Protestant uh, theological seminary or school, and we come out a Protestant minister. Then we're taught to, in our course to work up to the heads as fast as we can in that line. 
uh, where we're supposed to work in. And uh, I said, now, uh, do all of you work in the same field? No, says some of us work, but we all work in the church, trying to get the churches to unite with us and do what they want us, we want them to do. And what I learned, they were Jesuits. I know they don't want to infiltrate the Protestant churches, but they infiltrate their schools. Not all Catholics do their work in secret. Here is a letter from the president of Atlantic Union College to the faculty and staff, telling of the appointment of a consultant. It tells of his doctor's degree and other degrees from Harvard and other universities and colleges. This good Roman Catholic man brings a variety of experiences in a number of areas. It tells how he will assume the title of executive assistant to the president and will be warmly welcomed by the staff of Atlantic Union College. Here, uh, this letter is signed by the president himself. Here is a paper telling a prayer meeting was attacked uh, by Catholics in Mexico. The church bell is tolled and uh, it signaled an emergency and the people were told to force out these squatters, uh, invaders. They uh, said, we're believers in Jesus. We belong to the Virgin of Guadalupe. We don't want you here. Get out before we kill you. We're the authority here. 10,000, a mob of 10,000 shouted, kill them. This is a Catholic town. Sacred Hearts Cathedral in Richmond, Virginia. My father tells how when he was a boy, he and other children went down in the basement, saw cells and big bars, got scared and ran out. We, we were just curious. We walked in this large Catholic church. We went in the basement. <coughs> we saw some cells. We borrowed them, just like a jail. Huh. Cells were the sign in front of St. Rose Catholic Church, you see renew and celebration, two meaningful words the Catholics use. The other day I saw my wife, sweet Vanita, read a slip of paper that had come in the mail and then fall on her knees in prayer to our kind Heavenly Father. I thought, what could it be? Here it is. The thousands of Seventh-day Adventist delegates sat spellbound inside the gigantic Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis, Indiana. It was Monday morning, July 9, and the 55th World Conference of Seventh-day Adventists was being addressed by Reverend Father Thomas Murphy, Chief Ecumenical Officer of the Indianapolis Roman Catholic Archdiocese. Quoting the Friday, July 13, Indianapolis Star, Father Murphy said he thought his remarks had been well received. I have been impressed with the prayerfulness and the good spirit of this gathering. Here's a picture by a non-SDA man entitled The Return of the Cosmic King. In this picture you see in the upper corner there ghostly skeletons of the dead down below you see a Catholic view of hell with fiendish hands coming up from something living in the fire. Here is a pornographic picture of a fiend hugging that man. Here are planets uh, lined up like a form of New Age astrology, a New Age vertical rainbow uh, right up there, the hand with the fingers shaped like the sign the Pope gives. And when you look in the face you see a red nose like an alcoholic priest and the eyes and mouth appear as a man stoned on drugs. Here you see a dove as seen in the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. Here is a lady folding her arms, as Catholic do in Adoration of Mary. Here we see a Catholic picture of a naked body. And here is a Catholic concept of ghostly spirit man that you can see right through him coming from the dead. Uh, I learned from a man in the occult that to them the name Cosmo is another name for the devil. And, of course, cosmology is uh, the study of all the cosmos. Here you have, more appropriately in the setting, the devil himself impersonating Christ. Now, friend, I wouldn't blame this dear non-SDA man for painting this picture. I'm sure he didn't realize what he was doing. Here is the Directory of Christian Councils of the World Council of Churches. Inside, we see various countries around the world with a list of all the denominations or churches as members or associates, observers, consultants, or in ecumenical relationships. Here it says, All members of the Council shall accept the following doctrinal statement as a declaration of their essential spiritual unity. Here we see the World Council of Churches in a number of countries, 
and the Seventh-day Adventist Church listed among them. You heard a while ago the ex-Jesuit priests say that the Jesuits of Europe financed the World Council of Churches to help uh, unite the Protestant churches and that this was the beginning of the ecumenical movement. Here's a question. Would someone try to trick God's Seventh-day Adventist Church people into joining the World Council of Churches and the ecumenical movement with all the churches uniting in unity? Question, who would try to trick God's SDA people into doing it? Well, God's prophet says in Great Controversy 565 and 566 that the papacy is, quote, employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. Someone sent me some time ago a videotape on which there are interviews of various people. Uh, now, on this videotape, you're uh, not told who the names of the people are, which I guess is just as well. But there is one man on the videotape who is identified as a Seventh-day Adventist. I'll play it for you in just a moment. This man is questioned about his giving a medal to the Pope. Uh, now, here's a question. Do you believe that a Seventh-day Adventist would try to trick this dear man into giving a medal to the beast power which murdered the saints of the Lord? No Seventh-day Adventist could possibly try to trick anyone into representing God's remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church into giving a medal to the Antichrist, uh, whose institution will again, according to God's prophet, uh, join hands in a great threefold union to try to put God's people to death. Now keep in mind that God loves this dear man, and we love him, whoever he might be. I guarantee you this, as you show this uh, program to every Seventh-day Adventist that you can find. It will, by God's grace, wake them out of a death stupor and cause them to pray and study God's Word as never in their lives and draw closer to God than ever in their lives and press together with God's faithful Seventh-day Adventist to get God's three angels' messages out to the people of this world by the mighty power of God. Watch closely now to this interview. Everyone listen to the Pope speak on the importance of keeping Sunday as the Sabbath. We are called to reflect more deeply on the mystery of creation and therefore of our own life. We are called to rest. New Age Movement and Seventh-day Adventists. This is shocking, friend. Prepared by the Biblical Research Institute of the General Conference. This is a wonderful paper. It says a concerned mother swings a pendulum over her cancer-reflected son to determine what herbs are needed to cure his diseased condition. A lady suspends a lead crystal pendulum over a handful of vitamin C pills to determine her daily dose. Oh, friend... This is spiritualism. It's sorcery. Pray for these dear people. 
A gentleman attending a Pathfinder dinner dangles a nail tied to a string over a small amount of food in his hand to determine what he may safely eat. In a similar manner, a child checks her lunch at the school cafeteria. Uh, housewives shopping for groceries hold pendulums over lettuce. Participants of a 14-hour videotape titled Achieve Your Potential are taught to exercise the God power that everyone has within. Again, friend, this is sorcery. It says these experiences uh, could be multiplied. They are all involving Seventh-day Adventist church members. In certain instances, personnel in denominational churches and schools, professional and college-educated people are practicing these. Oh, friend, pray for these dear people that they may be truly converted, turn for the, from this spiritualism, doctrines of devils, and be prepared to stand in the presence of a holy God. Tongues, healings, communication with evil spirits, in the form of the dead, and miracles. These are some of the devices that will sweep the whole world into spiritualism and into the great temptation to go along with the national Sunday law. Friend, even the devil himself is converted nowadays. God's prophet says that they will have a zeal which will resemble a zeal for God. Now, watch closely as you will see a popular form of a Catholic charismatic celebration service in which procedures are practiced, some of which the devil will use to try to attack God's SDA church as well as many churches around this world to show that the mighty power of God is among them convincing them that they don't need to obey all the commandments of God perfectly by the grace of God, but can be forgiven and saved and sing and swing and sin and celebrate. Stand tongues because you can't understand them. That's your hotline up to God. Some of the elements that you just saw are already attacking God's Seventh-day Adventist Church. Other elements of it will attack it in the future. Keep in mind that God loves these dear people. He loves them. Uh, in Desire of Ages, the chapter called Barriers Broken Down, and again the chapter called Ministry, God's prophet tells us that Jesus uh, showed his disciples just a glimpse of the degradation of false worship, of the heathen worship, but only a glimpse, not to dwell on it, but simply so that they would be aware of it, so that they would appreciate the truth of God, the law of God, and that they would cling to Christ and be able to be better workers for the Master, having seen the difference between truth and error, dwelling on the truth, dwelling on the light, but getting a glimpse of it simply so they could better work for him. Now, what you just saw were non-SDA meetings, and I thank God for that. But what you're going to see now is a celebration 
uh, church or an SDA school or a Christian singing group or SDA singing group uh, which SDA youth were taken to and uh, this what you're going to see is also a part of the Catholic charismatic attack on God's SDA church you may weep for these dear people God loves them we love these people let your heart go out to our kind Heavenly Father for these young people and older people too whom the devil is using key people trying to lead these dear ones to sing and swing and sin and celebrate SDA youth were taken to see this Christian group in the church bus Selected Messages, page 36. The things you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me would take place just before the close of probation. Every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. There will be shouting with drums, music, and dancing. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never reveals itself in such methods, in such a bedlam of noise. This is an invention of Satan to cover up his ingenious methods for making of none effect the pure, sincere, elevating, ennobling, sanctifying truth for this time. Better never have the worship of God blended with music than to use musical instruments to do the work which last January was represented to me would be brought into our camp meetings. The truth for this time needs nothing of this kind. In its work of converting souls, a bedlam of noise shocks the senses and perverts that which, if conducted aright, might be a blessing. The powers of satanic agencies blend with the din and noise to have a carnival. And this is called the working of the Holy Spirit. History will be repeated. Oh, friend, it says, I felt greatly distressed. I was instructed to say that at these demonstrations, demons in the form of men are present, working with all the ingenuity that Satan can employ to make the truth disgusting to sensible people. It says, the third angel's message is to be given in straight lines. Friend, we must do it. It's the message of God's love, his tender love, his law, his Sabbath, the warning against the mark of the beast, which is the morning against the national Sunday law. Praise God, his people will not be diverted. 
We must reach the dear people before they're dead. Look here. It says Satan will make music a snare by the way in which it is conducted. Do you comprehend that? Oh, friend, pray for these dear people that we might be ready all together to stand in God's presence. And uh, the first uh, church we attended was a big church there in... Uh, I won't mention the name of it, but we walked in. It's a beautiful sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Son went back to the youth department, and we noticed there was drums set up, and they had guitars, and it was a band, and it was uh, it was shock to us because we're from, originally from Texas and had been in uh, Mississippi for about three years at that time. Uh -huh. And uh, we left him there, went into the sanctuary and uh, sat down in the big Sabbath school in the back. And this fella that was teaching the Sabbath school class, he got up, and uh, right away we, we caught the, uh, something different in that he was uh, downplaying the spirit of prophecy in Ellen White, as if it was sort of a, uh, if people cling to this, they're separationist. And hey, the, you say he was downplaying it? Well, it was downplaying it to the extent that we have too long been pushing Ellen White, and it's separating the people. And uh. we need to be able to get along whether we're uh, traditionalist or whether we're new theology, uh. and that we need to get in and live together. Uh -huh. And there was an old pastor in the back, and the elder stood up, the old man, and he tried to bring out that, you know, we, uh, how can two walk together? That's right. Uh, unless they agree. And... Uh, and so he, the teacher sort of downplayed that, and he even brought up Ford's name and, and brought out that he was a Christian. And, uh, and he sort of uh, lifted him up somewhat. Finally, as the this lesson went on, they really didn't touch the lesson, but they talked about traditionalists. Uh -huh. And they said that, uh, that what Adventists have been teaching about 1888 and... Uh, uh, 1844 and, and the subjects about uh, the sanctuary and all these teachings in the Catholic Church being the beast, uh -huh. all that was uh, 18th century theology. Hmm. Well, you know, that's just the types of things that the Jesuits would be would be talking about. That they they use that type of reasoning. Well, this is uh, this, this is the first time I had heard this openly in a Sabbath school class, and it was sort of as if. Uh, they said that most all of Protestant churches were teaching this. This was a common thing among all the uh, churches. And finally, I, I had about all I could stand, and I said, uh, really, if we would have put the spirit of prophecy away uh, 50 years ago, uh, there wouldn't be an Adventist church today. We'd be splintered off into 100 different areas because every yeah. time we have, a, have an area that we want to know... Uh, well, what does what does God want us to do? We go to the spirit of prophecy. And yeah. That brings us all back together. That's right. But if we throw her out, we're like a hundred different leaves blowing in the wind. Well, you see, that's the purpose of the papacy, to undo everything that Protestantism has done. So there'll be no one protesting anymore. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I, I, I appreciate what you said in the sermon, uh, Sabbath, and I guess that's why we're here now talking about this, but I'll go on and tell you what happened. After that, uh, when I made that statement, a lady turned around, and must have been one of their regular Sabbath school members, and she was real upset. She turned around and she said, this is what we've had in this church right here, is all this uh, bickering and babbling right in here. And she says, she pointed this book at me, and she said, you're trying to bring us back to Puritanism. Hmm. And I thought that maybe she was talking about the old pastor in the back, and my friend next to me, Sebastian, said, no, she's talking to you. So I realized we weren't really among friends anymore, and it wasn't the old Adventist family I once knew years ago as a boy growing up. Uh -huh. But so we didn't even stay for church. I went up, my, met my boy as he come out, and he was troubled with the kind of music and the type of program they had. What kind of music was well, it? Well, it was a, a lively music with uh, guitars. and. Did it have a rock beat? Yes, it had a beat to it, he says. And Then another Sabbath, I think it was the next Sabbath, why I thought, well, I'm going to... Let's find an Adventist church where my son can find some Adventist Jew. So we stopped by a little church, uh, and before uh, the Sabbath school started, and I bumped into the pastor. He was a young pastor. Uh -huh. And I said, well, is there a, a church where there's some young people? I want my boy to associate, because we've been out here in California for several weeks now. 
And he said, well, there's not many in our church. But he said, there's a new church. It's a celebration church uh -huh. that started up. And it's only been going a few months. Huh. But it's just, man, he said, it's great. I said, okay. So he, he wrote a little map. We went over there. And uh, when I got to the place, well, I found out it was Assembly of God. It was a, it was a, yeah, it was Assembly of God, big church. Huh. And uh, we, we That's part Pentecostal, isn't it? Yes. And I being, my dad was a Pentecostal, and hmm. and my mother was an Adventist. So uh, when growing up, I would go to a Pentecostal church huh. once on Sundays, and Sabbath we'd go to Adventist. Hmm. And I knew the difference. I, I oh, sensed yeah. it just yeah. by the atmosphere. Yeah. But when my brother and I grew up, well, we we went the way of my mother. We didn't, Praise the Lord. We didn't go with him. But yeah. Anyway, I had seen people with emotionalism many a time. So uh, we went in, and there wasn't Sabbath school, the head pastor of this place, that was leading out in it. And he was sort of letting us know that what we was fixing to see was going to be different than anything else we'd seen, huh. and that it was a, uh, a new way of worship. Huh. We looked in there, a big stage, and, and the chairs kind of going down. It was... It was uh, it was in a big dove was up in the ceiling. A dove? A dove in a glass, you know, up there. Uh-huh. And so we went outside, and we was talking to a fellow and his son and asking him some questions about it. And he is a, he's a member there, and he told us that we would experience a different type of music, and it was a different uh, type of worship. And uh, and we asked him, I said, well, like different what? He said, well, a week before they had a Christian rock band in there that uh -huh. wasn't Adventist, and he said some of the people of visitors had got up and left hmm. and it seemed like they had mostly music in the program mm -hmm. there was two people leading the music a, a large fella and a, a lady and the lady she uh, uh, would would they sing together and so it was kind of production and the words was projected on a screen uh -huh. and nobody had hymnals hmm. so I guess that was because your hands could be free to clap yeah, and you didn't, uh, did you sing the old uh, hymns that you're used to? No, we didn't sing those hymns, and it was sort of a lively beat. In fact, I noticed some of the ushers were sort of dancing around like this, you know. They were, they were kind of doing this to the music, you know. Dancing around. And they finally got to the sermon, and uh, it was, uh, it wasn't that been his sermon. He had asked the people to uh, uh, all pray out loud at the same time. Huh everybody in the audience mm -hmm. and uh why well, I, I said man that's what i saw as a boy when i was went yeah. to these pentecostal meetings and my yeah. grandparents we'd all everybody would pray out loud at the same time yeah and uh, and they uh, when they speak in tongues they i've seen them all speak in tongues at the same time yeah well so i i said you know this is this is uh this is like what i saw when i was a boy in the pentecostal church hmm. he that didn't seem to phase him mm-hmm and so we asked him about different things, the jewelry, and he said, well, that's biblical, it's in the Bible. We asked him about a lot of the standards that, that we were, uh, you know, had, I believe is Adventist. Uh -huh. And uh, my boy standing there, I didn't like uh, his attitude, the way he was downplaying the Adventist uh, that we all knew, uh -huh. that I had tried to, to teach my boy. The pillars of God's uh, Yes, faith. and it, it seemed like even a subtle way was... Uh, tearing down what I had tried to do uh, yes. in my son's eyes to uphold the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. I can tell you this, that that dear man, number one, God loves him. Number two, this man, by his fruits, is not a Seventh-day Adventist. Well, that's the way I felt, and I, my son and I, we talked about that as we were leaving, that uh, we were alarmed. That's the first experience I'd ever really heard about the Celebration Church. Uh -huh. When we got home, I, I went to some of the people in the church. I went and talked to the pastor. I went and talked to some of the others, uh -huh. relaying what I'd seen. Uh -huh. And uh, they didn't seem to... Uh, it was as if they didn't really believe me. But you that saw? I might have been uh, just exaggerating. spiritual blessing did you get at the Celebration Church? I didn't get a spiritual blessing. 
it, it actually frightened me because I'd always, as a boy, having to go with my dad, I didn't want to go to these uh, uh, Pentecostal churches. And during this time, he would be unreasonable. He would, I've seen him fly into fits. And, and uh, at one time, I, I was sitting down on the porch and I, I heard him, a big racket in there, and he'd taken him through the coffee table all through a, a window. And this was during the time that he would be going to these churches. It was as if a demon had control of him. So I felt that somewhere along the line, this charismatic movement, this yes. boy, was going to be part of the yes. the people that was going to hunt Seventh-day Adventists. Yes, uh, it's the Catholic charismatic attack on God's SDA church. Yeah, most people are innocent. They don't yes. know what's going on, and, right. and, and sometimes the pastors are innocent to Do them. you think they need to know? Oh, they need to know. I'll tell you something. I wouldn't have known myself if I hadn't been raised in a Pentecostal church huh. with my dad and knowing. I know what's there. I know what it, it does. And I, I know this emotionalism. Huh. When it takes control of people, there's no reasoning with them. i tell you, our people, they at least need to know yes. so they can make a choice which Amen. way they want to go. Amen. We're in the great shaking time. People are making choices now for life or death. Oh, friends, I thank God for sincere, dedicated Seventh-day Adventist members and leaders, such as the Dean of Men of one of our colleges that you just heard from. You know, you've heard of a man named Desmond Ford and Dr. Colin Standish. These two men were talking one day. Dr. Standish told me this, plus it's documented. Dr. Ford was insinuating that the Adventist message is Romanist and Catholic. Dr. Stanley said, it's not fair of you to insinuate that the Adventist message is Romanist and Catholic. Dr. Ford said, well, I guess you're right. I shouldn't insinuate such things. Dr. Stanley said, you know, and I know, but hardly anyone that hears you knows that what you're teaching is unadulterated Augustinian Catholicism. And you know, Dr. Uh, Ford could not deny it because really that's what the new theology people are teaching. Of course, Dr. Ford, you might say, is the chief proponent of the new theology. Oh, friend, we need to pray for these dear people. God loves these people. Friend, God loves you. The lovely Jesus shed his blood on the cross of Calvary for these dear people that you're seeing on this program right now. Every single person you've seen of and heard of we love these people. We're just sharing with you the facts so that your eyes can be opened and you can know concerning this great attack, Catholic charismatic attack upon God's Seventh-day Adventist church and be able to help other Seventh-day Adventists by showing them these very programs. The new theology people are not Seventh-day Adventists, whether they know it or not. They are Catholic charismatic people. A master level hypnotist who is uh, in his organization and with his workers teaching ministers neuro-linguistic programming. He also teaches other things such as hypnotism. But even in lab one and lab two they get the very principles that they learn later in hypnotism itself. Watch very closely to the first part of this and in part two we're going to go much more in detail on this. Watch closely now to this interview. It's basically boils down to his mind control. But it never says that. It never uses the word hypnosis or program or anything. But it is. But we wrote, we got some information from John Savage's foundation. He teaches master level his hypnosis. Um, and he, what he incorporates into these calling and caring church ministry is neuro-linguistics programming, which is called NLP. Uh -huh. um, it's based on Ericksonian hypnosis. Uh -huh. And I found all that out because I called the psychologist in Boone, I called my mother, and she's a, hip she's a hypnotist. Your mother? My mother's a hypnotherapist. Uh -huh. She has an MA, and she has a certification in hypnosis. Uh -huh. So I wrote down, every person I called, I took notes on everything they said. I guess my husband and I grew up in psychologist homes. We did not, we were not raised Adventist. I've been an Adventist now for 12 years. Uh -huh. um, they use a lot of role modeling, role reversals, which, you know, when you grow up in a psychologist home, you don't think anything of it. And until you realize it's linked 
is mind control, yeah. role reversals. So what she explained to me was that they'll never use the word hypnosis. Never, ever, ever. She said you will never hear it, but it is based on it. So they have all these things they learn about how to use hypnosis without you ever knowing it. In other words, saying things and doing things to get you to do what they want you to do. Right. Like there's part of it is called ideomotor signaling. Mm-hmm. Ideomotor signaling is something that's just casual now. It's called it's body mirroring. Yes. If you're sitting like that, what the psychologist would do is mimic everything you're doing. Yes. And you because know, it's a instant bond. When our pastor presented to the church, first we had just heard the rumor that he was going to do it. So we started. My husband's a head elder, a friend is the elder, and I started getting everybody we could find out in literature immediately because we felt like it was a very dangerous thing. And that's where we found out that this man teaches master-level hypnosis. And you know, the Bible says that there's sudden destruction. That anybody who consults with a charmer or sorcerer, yeah. and what is hypnosis but any of that? So my mother said that in her practice, that the biggest part is uh, getting the client over their fears of hypnosis. And so it's a resistance. She said you had to break down the resistance. She said most of the time is spent on that. So they have, of course, what they're doing in the churches but the pastors may never be told that there's hypnosis involved in it. But, so um, the pastors don't understand what they're really doing. But the pastors we've talked about it are very angry when we bring it up. I mean, it's like if you're really a man of God, wouldn't you want to consider it? If there are articles, if this man's own institution is saying he's a master hypnotist, wouldn't you want to consider it? We've gone to six churches, and every one of them are either involved with it or doing it or about to do it. And they didn't want a thing said about it against it. Then he said he wanted to do it. But so he started having people do things that would, what you have to do is cut down their inhibitions. If you can get them to do something once, yeah. the next time it'll be easier. Yeah. So the next time you have them sing a Pentecost song, oh yeah, we did that before. Hey, let's, let's not make it hard on the guy. Let's just go ahead and do it. Mm-hmm. So when we realized he really was going to do it, we went to him. Mm-hmm. So we explained everything we knew. Because he first got everybody to agree to it before they knew anything about it. And they got tons and tons of people who were backslidden. So to them, we're going to get our people back. And that's how we presented it. That's one of the things. We're going to teach you how to listen and how to bring people who are backslidden back into the church. So so then we talked to him when he finally came back to our church. We presented everything we knew. And then he dropped in church, all in a circle. And an 80-year-old woman said, this is hypnosis. And then they went ahead and did it. You know, she was so shocked because she knew it was the starting of hypnosis. Yes. And she went ahead and did it. But what it is, is you get them to obey you. Uh-huh. You have to get them to where they'll, even though they don't want to, do it anyway, do it anyway because, oh, well, we don't want to make the pastor feel bad or yes. everybody else is doing it. That's right. And it's like, and so you get them to go step past step. I said, now these are my laws. Uh-huh. And the same things that when you're on the outside, it's like, what do you mean, my laws? No, we don't listen to a man's This laws. is the principle the papacy uses. Do it because I say so or else. Yeah. And the papacy is training people, even they threaten their own priests, not to question the authorities. And this is leading to the image of the beast, the Sunday law, and the mark of the beast for people that have be lost. Frogs into princes, neuro-linguistic programming. Oh, friend, pray for these dear people. This is a uh, dangerous thing, spiritualism. Uh, Revelation 18:23. For by thy sorceries were all nations to see. We have much on it. We're going to get much into this in part two. Here it says, read about neurolinguistic programming. The two authors, uh, it says, uh, demonstrating Ericksonian style hypnosis. It will not have any canned induction in this book. Here it talks about hypnotic technique as well as how to apply NLP within trance states. Of course, you know what that means. Here's a section on self-hypnosis. Listen closely now to some important points I'll share with you quickly. Number one, the foundation pillars of the Seventh Adventist Church were laid by God Himself. Let no one touch them. Anyone trying to tamper with or minimize the great teachings of God's SD Church will one day wish they hadn't in the judgment of God. Number two, everyone now is moving one way or the other, either to our kind Heavenly Father and dear Jesus, or away from Him to self and sin and this world. Either we're moving to become filled totally with the Spirit of God in the latter rain, or to be demon-possessed, one or the other. 
O oh, friend, which way are you moving? Point number two, the cross of Calvary with its bleeding victim and the love of God will uh, touch the heart of God's people so much and melt their hearts, cause them to fall in love with God so that they will hate sin that murdered dear Jesus on the cross. And while the Catholic charismatic people are excusing sin, God's SDA people would rather die than sin against him anymore. And they will overcome by the free gift of grace that God gives under the new covenant. Oh yes, they'll receive the latter rain and get God's three angels' messages out to the world. How is it with you, friend? Is there anything in your life that would separate you from God, that would cause you to be consumed in the presence of a holy, sin-hating God? Oh yes, God's grace is sufficient. He will help you. Soon it will be too late. Point number four. The Catholic charismatic people will falsely accuse you and me and they will fight against this program and all of God's truth and uh, but in so doing they will actually identify themselves who they really are that's an awesome thought wouldn't you say oh yes now I've learned enough about these dear people who say they are Jews and are not but are of the synagogue of Satan to know that some of their methods as they accuse God's dear Seventh Adventist people some methods they use are joking sarcasm and anger therefore friend accuse no one of anything anyone going around accusing angrily or uh, being unkind is not from me or from the lovely Jesus dear Jesus did not suppress even one word of truth he spoke it always in love. He used tact and kindness. He was never rude. He fearlessly denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and sin. But tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. Desire of Ages 353. Friend, God's people will be the same. Because of what's going on in this world, friend, we know that time now is running out. And because there's so much on this very program, the second time you watch it, you'll get much more out of it than you did the first time. Now, here's a question. Should we wait until the National Sunday Law is passed and people have received the mark of the beast and the judgments of God are falling upon them and they're trying to bind us hand and foot before we get God's three angels' messages out to the people? Oh, friend, that's what the devil's hoping we'll do. Even now, God's prophet says light has come to us, showing us that the great day of the Lord is at hand, even at the doors. 90, page 20. The Catholic charismatic people will try to stop you from getting God's third angel's messages out to the people of this world because the devil and his agents are afraid of it. They know what it will do. And, oh, friend... Uh, it is the only message that can penetrate the TV minds of today. And this is why the book, National Sunday Law, was written. I want you to listen closely to what our mighty God will do. I'm picking up the great controversy, and I'm reading here in page 612. Listen. Servants of God, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. Signs and wonders will follow the, the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing fire down from heaven in the sight of men. Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness. And the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. Family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. 
Praise God, friend. Praise God.